Some say it takes a weak person to seek out revenge against one who has wronged them. I'm not so sure about that. Frank Eaton was just a boy when his father was brutally murdered. Frank was born in 1860 in Hartford, Connecticut to a father who was a vigilante. At the age of eight, he witnessed as his father was gunned down by a group of six former Confederate soldiers who rode with a group that referred to themselves as regulators. He was devastated by the death of his father and immediately developed a relentless hatred for his killers. Not long after the murder, a good friend of Frank's father approached Frank and urged him to take revenge on behalf of his father. He said, my boy, may an old man's curse rest upon you if you do not try to avenge your father. The man even went as far as to give Frank his own gun and trained him on how to use it. By the age of 15, Frank had become an impressive shooter. He visited Fort Gibson in Oklahoma to learn how to better handle a gun. Though he was too young to join the army, he did go shooting with some of the soldiers there. Everyone was shocked by Frank's ability. He outshot soldier after soldier. Eventually, the cavalry's best marksmen went up against Frank, and each one of them tasted defeat. Frank's skill surpassed their own at every turn. The fort's commanding officer approached Frank and bestowed upon him a marksmanship badge and a new nickname, which he kept throughout his life, Pistol Pete. Pistol Pete was said to have had a faster draw than even the famous Buffalo Bill, and by the age of 17, he became one of the youngest U.S. Marshals in history. Now with skill and authority, Frank took to avenge his father. One by one, he tracked down the men that had been there that day, and one by one, he gunned them down with unparalleled ability and ferocity. Only one of the regulators managed to escape Pistol Pete's wrath, and that was only because he was killed before Frank could get to him. Frank lived a long life, eventually becoming an author until he passed away in 1958 at the age of 97. The dentist. While most of us are afraid of them, we don't often consider them to be badasses. But for one dentist in particular, this was exactly the case. Born in Wisconsin in 1914, Ben Salomon lived a dedicated life. He became an Eagle Scout and attended a dental university. After graduating in 1937, he opened his own practice. Life was good for Ben as he walked a successful path. In 1940, however, things changed for him. He was drafted into World War II, but that didn't stop him from living successfully. Ben was assigned to the Army Dental Corps, where he put his skills to good use for the dental care of the soldiers. In 1944, in this capacity, he was promoted to captain. Ben was fortunate to be able to do what he loved and avoid combat. However, he couldn't avoid it forever. Ben met with his first combat experience when he was sent to Saipan. With little dental work to perform while soldiers battled, he offered to replace a wounded surgeon. Ben knew that this new position would put him in harm's way, but he went willingly anyway. Danger did eventually catch up with Ben when Japanese troops surrounded his aid station. Four Japanese soldiers infiltrated Ben's tent and one of them killed one of the soldiers he had just saved. Infuriated and switched into survival mode, Ben took down each soldier. The last one he headbutted into submission. In order to provide the wounded with a way to escape, he took up a machine gun and began firing off into the swarms of troops heading his way. Japanese soldiers fired back, barely able to fight off the dentist's assault. Ben fought to his death so that others could live. When his body was found, he was slumped over his machine gun and 98 dead Japanese soldiers were piled in front of him. It was revealed that Ben had been shot 76 times and bayoneted over two dozen times before he stopped shooting. And for this, he became one of only three dentists to ever receive the Medal of Honor.
Olga and Igor were proud rulers. They ruled the former federation of East Slavic tribes known as the Kievan Rus. Igor one day ventured into a nearby tribe to collect tribute. Tributes were often exacted as a way to show respect or allegiance. But this casual occurrence took a poor turn when the tribe Igor was collecting from had a sudden idea. In order for their tribe to take control of the state, they would need to put their own prince in the throne. Igor's wife Olga was much too occupied with her current marriage, so in order to fix this small problem, the tribe assassinated Igor and left Princess Olga a widow. Olga, now unwed and alone, was seen as weak and even a pushover, and the tribe took advantage of this. Following through with their ingenious plan, they began to pressure Olga to marry their prince, Prince Mal. Olga, infuriated not only by the murder of her husband, but by the incessant nagging by the tribe that killed him, played it very cool. She sent word that she was open to the idea of remarriage and requested that the tribe send its nobles over by boat. She said they could remain in their boat overnight and she would send servants to them in the morning where they and their boat would be carried into the city and honored by Olga herself once they arrived. They took her up on her proposal and spent the initial night in the boat. But Olga had other plans in mind for the 20 nobles. While the nobles slept in their boat, Olga had her servants dig a tremendous hole. Once morning came, the servants did as Olga promised. They retrieved the boat, carried it into the city, only to be dumped with all the nobles aboard into the giant hole. The nobles screamed, begged, and pleaded for their lives as Olga then, with a smile on her face, ordered the hole to be filled in burying them all alive. But Olga's vengeance was far from over. Olga sent word to the tribe once more, claiming that if they truly wanted her to marry their prince, they would need to send a group of distinguished nobles to escort her personally to the prince himself. Anything less would be considered a great offense. Thinking that this was their moment to secure the throne, the tribe agreed and sent more nobles into Olga's clutches. When they arrived, Olga insisted that the men wash themselves off as they were dirty from traveling. A bath hut had been warmed and prepared for them, and the noblemen obliged eagerly. Once inside, the men realized that the exits had been sealed and the hut set on fire. All of the men burned alive inside. But Olga was not finished yet. She went on to hold a memorial event for her husband where she invited people of her targeted tribe. 5,000 of them showed up to the event and all 5,000 of them died when Olga ordered her soldiers to mercilessly slaughter them once they had all arrived. Olga had blood on her hands, more blood than would suffice for the loss of a loved one, perhaps. But it wasn't enough. Eventually, Olga led an all-out assault on the tribe's city, but for the first time failed in her mission to kill them. Their numbers were too great and they remained resilient to her advances. However, she was still greatly feared by this point. Olga, in a brief moment of mercy, offered to leave the tribe be, as long as they paid tribute. However, her assault had left them with little to offer, so she claimed that she would take payment in the form of birds, doves and sparrows specifically. Every home would need to offer some. The tribe, willing to do anything to send Olga away, collected doves and sparrows in great multitudes from around their city and brought them to Olga. She then ordered all of the tribe's people to return to their homes and rest for the night. Olga then put her soldiers to work. Wood was burned in great quantities and smoldering pieces were attached to the birds. Once they were properly fixed, the birds were released to return back to their nests within the city. Doing so resulted in the entire city engulfing into flames, burning alive countless people. Those who managed to escape the flames were slaughtered by Olga's men or imprisoned and forced into slavery for the rest of their days. It was only then that Olga released the tribe of their debt for killing her husband. Olga went on to rule unchecked for the rest of her life. For some, punishment only fits the crime when everyone involved is dead. That's all for now. Remember, you may not believe it, but anything is possible in a world so seriously strange. I'm Rob Dyke, and I'll see you next Wednesday, so don't forget to subscribe, because you won't want to miss what's next.